Good afternoon, everybody. Um, oh, it feels nice in this room. I, but this morning I was up in the Lancaster and it felt nice there and it feels nice in this room. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's a great pleasure. I had the wonderful experience of being able to go and visit um, the Freedom Institute last, um, I think, last end of last summer. And I, may, I met Rush, Rachel then and then we met again in the States. And Rachel is the is chief clinical officer not do, yeah i get a bit muddled um with the different titles of the freedom institute rachel is also originally from the uk uh, um which was nice to know because that always adds to it but um they are well the programs that rachel heads they are having phenomenal um impacts on schools and different services the training program all of the work that you're doing is having a really big impact and um i persuaded rachel to come over to the uk and talk to us about what they are doing and it is it is relative it's totally relative and plus it comes from a british head so All's good, and I'm going to hand over and say thank you so much for being here. Thank you. All right. Happy to be here. Hello, everybody. Ooh, that's a bit loud. Double microphone. Um, it's true I was born here, but I've spent most of my life in the States, so I sound very American to any of you who are from the UK, I'm sure. Um, I actually get very confused here because my tendency is to switch more towards a British accent, which is how my parents still talk when I'm around English people. and more American when I'm around American people and then when I come here and I'm surrounded by Americans I get thoroughly confused <laughs> so if you hear me sounding a bit crazy that's why um, I want to say thank you to Sam and her team for organizing this lovely conference and also thank you to all the volunteers that are helping with it and the hotel <coughs> staff because there's a lot of people behind the scenes serving coffee and cleaning up and organizing rooms and taking names and managing lists and doing whatever else they're doing. It's a tremendous amount of work, and I think those people often go unrecognized. So I just want to give them a little, what we call a shout out as well. Um, so as Sam said, I'm the Chief Clinical Officer of Freedom Institute, which we'll talk about in a minute. And what I'm here today to talk to you about is the work that we do with families primarily, which comes from a slightly um, unusual framework, and I think is a really powerful way to start thinking about how we treat addiction differently. So our agenda, what we hope to accomplish, did my timer start? No. What we hope to accomplish in the next hour and a half is just an introduction and give you some context for the work that we do and sort of where this work, where are these theories developed. A quick overview of our programming just so you have a sense of what it is that we do and how it all fits together. What our approach is to family work. What relational or systemic thinking is, which is the foundation of our approach to family work. A quick overview of sort of the nuts and bolts of a multifamily group model that we use that it is fairly adaptable and many of you I think could take it and use it in your own settings for those of you who are treatment providers. And then a quick, very quick summary of some of the results we've seen and some of the challenges. Um, before we go any further, I'm curious, how many of you work directly with clients? Oh, pretty much everybody. Okay, great. And how many of you are UK based? Okay, and how many US based? And how many um, other places other than the UK or US? Oh wow, big crowd, okay, good. So Freedom Institute, just to give you a little bit of history, we've been around for 42 years now in New York City. We were founded by a woman named Mona Mansell, who um, outwardly had a very perfect life. She was married to a very successful businessman. They lived in the fanciest part of New York City. They had four lovely children and behind the scenes, active social life, the whole volunteer work, the whole nine behind the scenes, she was a really serious alcoholic. And after she got sober, she decided she wanted to give back and she went to the Johnson Institute in Minnesota and got trained on doing interventions. And that was actually the genesis of Freedom Institute. And we've grown organically since then, adding sort of programs and work along the way. Um, we're non, not for profit. We do charge fees for our services, but we, um, also fundraise to support that because our fees don't cover the cost of doing business. We're located in Midtown Manhattan, which is sort of easily accessible for the families that we work with, but very expensive real estate. Um, I can actually see Trump Tower out my office window. You, will <laughs> you can imagine that. Um, I have not covered it with tinfoil, but <laughs> I'm not sure why. 
um, keep the evil rays back. Um, our clinical team, so our, our clientele tend to be highly educated, outwardly successful professionals and their kids, higher socioeconomic status, some high socioeconomic status people. We get some high profile people, um, and then a lot of working professionals, bankers, lawyers, Wall Street types, um, and their family members. Um, like I said, very educated, typically successful group can also be a bit entitled, tend to be very privileged. So um, all our clinical team have advanced degrees, masters or PhDs, and a lot of them have advanced training beyond that as well. Um, they have a variety of theoretical approaches. We've got um, a lot of people who are psychodynamically trained, a couple of psychoanalysts, people trained in family systems, which we're going to talk about today, somatic experiencing, psychodrama, and then our core um, chemical dependency treatment team have all been DBT trained by the behavioral tech. And we um, run sort of the core of our intensive outpatient programming is DBT based. And we try to be as adherent as we can to the model. We have a consultant from McLean Hospital, which is one of the big DBT places in the States, um, who does weekly supervision for the DBT team. So we've really created this sort of hybrid model. And since we started that, Marsha Linehan's come out with her whole substance abuse module, which has been very helpful. But we're constantly kind of trying to strike that balance and be as adherent as we can within an outpatient substance use context. Um, uh, just another quick note about, oops, about context. Um, all this work has developed in the context of a predominantly white population, pretty affluent population, um, mostly cisgender, heteronormative. So that's the context, and I think it's important to identify that because um, some of you may be working with groups that are different than that and may need to make adjustments. So this definitely has sort of a cultural identity to it. <clears throat> so just quickly, Freedom Institute's program offerings, like I said, we have an intensive outpatient program based primarily in DBT. It's three days a week. Typical, the minimum length of stay is eight weeks. Sometimes it's a bit longer. We do, it's abstinence-based. We do random drug testing on site. The specimens are sent off to the lab for verification, so we take that pretty seriously. We've got a range of recovery groups, early recovery for people with less than three months sober, advanced recovery three months to a year, extended recovery more than a year. We've actually got a couple of groups that have been together for over five, six years. We've got one men's group that's been together. They're a psychodrama group. They've been together about eight years now. Um, we just, they just can't get enough. So, and I think it's actually, I think it's because it's harder for men to get the social and emotional support they need in the community than for women. Our women's groups don't typically last that long, but the men's group just keeps going and keeps going. And the guys who have been in there, sort of the core group who have been in there since the beginning, mentor the new guys as they come in. It's actually quite lovely. Um, and, it, our, and standalone DBT groups, which run in the evening. And so people are able, for people who have maintained a level of functionality where they're still working or in school and kind of keeping their lives together but still need addiction treatment, um, they can do sort of a mix and match of these evening offerings to create sort of a mimic of the IOP, which happens in the mornings. It's not quite as intense, but it's, it's um, a lot more substantial than just one group a week. We get about half our clients come to us as primary care. They've never been to residential. They're coming with the recommendation of their family or their boss, or they've just recognized they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And about half come from residential programs. So it's continuing care for them. And we really support that model even for people who come to us and then go to inpatient is come back and do that so that they've got step down levels of care at least through the first year of recovery. <coughs> Other things we do, just quickly, care coordination. We have an interventionist on staff. We do assessments, treatment planning, referrals. Not as many as we used to. Google has sort of taken over that function. And in New York City, there's a large community of sober coaches, recovery coaches, sober livings. There's a whole industry that's popped up around addiction treatment. So a lot of those people now are doing this kind of case management and referral work. Our family service, which we're going to talk about more today, Family therapy, couples therapy, we have a parent group, we have a significant other group, and then we do multifamily groups. And then we also have an arm, which is separate from the clinical programming, called Hallways, which is a school-based prevention program that works in the private you know, tuition pay schools in New York City, doing substance abuse prevention and prevention of other high-risk behaviors. It's based on um, prevention science, evidence-based model, geared around skill building, social emotional wellness, um, and we're additionally seeing, excuse me, we do policy consultation, student work, faculty work, parent work, and we're additionally getting recently and within the last year, 
um, a lot more requests for help around issues of consent and gender-based violence and sexual harassment, which has been sort of pandemic on college campuses across the US and is now really showing up in a lot of the high schools. And schools are just not equipped to know what to do with it. And we've got a couple of specialists on our staff who have done a lot of work in that area and so do a lot of work with those schools. Any questions about any of that? Okay. So this is a tea towel, dish towel, that my sister gave me for Christmas that's currently hanging on my stove, which is why it's such a terrible looking picture. Um, but I took it partly tongue in cheek and partly because I think we do understand so much more about clients when we meet their families and get to know their families. And we also understand a lot more about their families and can develop empathy for where the families are coming from. I think historically addiction treatment has done a lot to separate individuals from families, which we'll get into more later. Um, and I don't think that serves anybody. I think being able to look at both, help both, treat both, integrate both, actually is a much more holistic and successful and sort of humanistic model. A um, Couple of notes about terminology, because I'm not familiar with the terminology that you use in the places you are. Um, Officially in the U.S. now, we're supposed to be using substance use disorder instead of addiction or chemically dependent. We're working on making that shift, but old habits die hard. So I still often tend to refer to a chemically dependent person as a CD. Um, I don't mean any disrespect by that. It's shorthand. I'm working on it. Um, we try not to use the word addict, but again, some things are pretty ingrained. And um, so when we're talking about a primary client or a primary patient, typically it is the chemically dependent person. And all of the work that we do is in the context of an abstinence-based model. However, in recent years, we've made a little bit of allowance for people who are on some of the, who are on psychotropic medications, and occasionally we'll take somebody who's on a Suboxone taper. Um, we tend to strongly prefer Vivitrol, but we will take people on a Suboxone taper. So just a little more context for you. So this is a very simple spectrum of sort of responses that we see typically in families around substance use disorder and addiction. So on the one end, you've got people ignoring and denying the problem. On the other end, you've got people sort of focusing and obsessing about the problem. And you often have people at different places on this spectrum within the same family, which can cause a lot of conflict. We understand that addiction is a disease, and yet there's no other disease that creates so much confusion and conflict within families about how the family should respond to the sufferer, the primary patient. Um, addiction kind of hijacks the individual brain, as we know, and so part of the disease includes often terrible behavior towards other people in the family or really dysfunctional behavior in larger life, which you don't see in things like diabetes or multiple sclerosis or leukemia. So it gets really confusing for families. Um, families wrestle with where they belong on this spectrum, with how to have compassion and boundaries, how to keep the addicted person safe slash alive, especially in the current opioid epidemic that we're seeing in the States, um, without enabling them, and a lot of these dichotomies. And so part of the work that we do with families is helping families wrestle with this spectrum and where they think they need to be. Addiction really fosters uh, disconnection and blame. And I think we've done an amazing job in our industry of being able to simultaneously blame addicts and blame families, so everybody's at fault. Um, and that's not really a very useful way of going about things if you want people to feel motivated to change and to get over the shame and isolation of the disease. Um, but the dominant idea, particularly in the US, I can't speak for anywhere else, is still that addiction is a disease that one person in the family gets, and then that person impacts everybody else in the family. And we actually define it very differently, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and just quickly, this, even this simple spectrum can be a really useful exercise to do with families, to lay it out either just on paper or on the floor, like you do a spectrogram, for those of you who know psychodrama, and have them identify where they think they fall on this spectrum. Maybe it changes day to day. Maybe when certain things are happening, they're at one end. When other things are happening, they're at the other end. It's really common to see spouses be on opposite ends of this spectrum. So being able to talk about that and locate themselves and for family members to talk too about where they see other people in the family being on the spectrum. Um, and there's a case example we'll get to later that will highlight that. 
<clears throat> so historically, free family work at Freedom Institute, going back like 10 years and more, uh, was done similarly to how it's done in much of the US in most treatment programs still, which is that individuals and families are separate for most of the work. And occasionally, maybe the family joins a session with the individual therapist and the individual client. Um, but there's this notion that clients need to be ready and they need to have enough recovery before we can bring in the family to do work. Oftentimes that's benchmarked at 90 days. I don't know if that was made up randomly or if people really did any kind of sort of evidence seeking to see if that made sense to them. But that's typically what programs do. You hear a lot about codependence, um, toxicity, and the importance of letting go. Um, and any work that's done with families in residential programs tends to have a really strong education focus. So it's really about educating the family about the disease and the effects of the disease, but that's sort of as far as it goes. And then what typically happens is other people pick up the pieces and there's a lot of coaching around boundary setting, not being codependent, not enabling. Me and technology. Um, so you'll either see parallel tracks where really the individual and the family are never together in the same room doing work, or you'll see, oh, look at how that showed, you'll see um, little bits of work happening together but not very much. One of the weaknesses of this is that when you're doing parallel work, you really have a much stronger behavioral focus and the relationships sort of get ignored. There's no professional intervention or help happening with the relationship in a live setting. So about eight years ago, almost nine now, um, we decided to change that and we hired specially trained family therapists and now this is more the model that we use for doing individual and family work. So individuals are still doing their own work, families are still doing their own work, but we welcome an overlap between the individual and family work and we'll start it right from day one, right from assessment. Um, when we do family work on an ongoing basis, most of it is with the whole family. So we're not doing what you see a lot of places um, like bringing in, for instance, if you've got a young adult client, bringing in the parents to do a lot of work themselves, separate from the addict, chemically dependent person, or doing work with like the parents and the chemically dependent person or the spouse and the chemically dependent person and leaving out the other members of the family. We don't typically do that. We try to work with the whole family. <clears throat> this doesn't necessarily mean that the whole family is coming to every session. Part of how our family therapists are trained is um, part of their training and part of their work is deciding which parts of the family to include when, um, which is sort of beyond the scope of what we can talk about today. But <clears throat> So examples of how we do this, which I'll talk more about in a second, we do joint assessments. So people, we offer, right when people make the first phone call, we ask them, do you want to bring your family in for the assessment too? And if they do, there's an individual therapist and a family therapist involved in the assessment. Um, the whole family sits down together with both therapists for about 20, 30 minutes. And then the individual therapist takes the individual with the chemical dependency issues to a different room and does our standard substance use disorder assessment. And the family therapist continues the assessment with the family. And then the two therapists get back together, compare notes, consult with the treatment team if it's a complicated case, and then make their recommendations based on that. Um, this starts from the very beginning, the notion that the problem isn't just one person's problem. It's something that everybody needs to be invested in, and everybody's got healing and recovery work to do. Um, we often, from the very beginning, even if people elect not to do the joint assessment, we often recommend either our parent group, significant other group, or family therapy, again, right from the very beginning, because our belief is that it's unrealistic to expect somebody to get sober in an environment that's not changing. The whole system has to change if it's gonna support any changes that they're trying to make. Um, and our intensive outpatient program includes a multifamily group once every cycle, so once every eight weeks and we'll go into more detail about that later. And it also includes a free family session for whoever the primary client identifies as their family during the course of treatment. And then obviously they can do more family sessions after that, but we give them one for free just to sort of entice them to try it because one of the barriers many times is by the time families get to us, they've spent so many resources on treatment, the last thing they wanna do is spend more money, particularly if they haven't yet been able to see how they may have work that they need to do as well. Um, to give credit where it's due, these two lovely smiling people, uh, Carrie Sanders and Frank Wells, are sort of the architects of the family work that we have at Freedom Institute. They were both trained at the Ackerman Institute, which is a family therapy training 
school, one of the last surviving independent ones in the US, actually. Um, their model, the Ackerman model, <coughs> excuse me, is relational and systemic, and it combines elements from all the other big schools of family therapy. And so each of them um, have been through three years, three, actually more than three years of postgraduate training that's pretty intensive. There's two-way mirrors, live sessions, a lot of supervision coursework. It's pretty grueling. So they're really, they're amazing, the work that they do. The two of them, it's, it's really amazing. I don't claim to be anywhere near the expert that they are, but they've, um, I've worked with them to kind of help construct the way um, we do our programming. So um, these are sort of the primary ways that you'll see us work with families. The, I think one important thing about having family therapists distinct from individual therapists is it protects our individual therapists from the very helpful family members that often have a lot to say about how treatment should go for the individual who's chemically dependent. Um, we actually mandate for young adults who are either still living at home or being financially supported by their parents, and that's a lot of our population, um, we mandate that the parents come to assessment. We won't do assessment without the parents because it's just a recipe for disaster. If they're still financially dependent and or living at home, in a lot of ways they aren't launched or emerged as adults. And so, of course, the, fam the parents want to know what's happening. They want reports. They want information. They want to give advice. And it gets really complicated from a clinical perspective if you've got an individual therapist fielding calls from mom every three days or dad once a week about, did you test him this week? Have you had the results back from the lab? Make sure you talk about this. He had a big fight with his aunt. It's, it's really not helpful. So we give the family a family therapist. And we say, here's your person. Any concerns you have, call this person. The treatment team all works together. We coordinate. But that person is your person. They will be the ones who facilitate sharing information with you. They will be the ones who take information from you and share it with the treatment team. And we set a hard boundary between the family and the individual therapist. And this does amazing things, particularly for young adults who feel so scrutinized and policed by their families. It's not safe for them to have a therapeutic relationship with an individual therapist who's on the phone with their parents every five minutes. So creating that boundary really gives them the space to do the work that they need to do without interference. Um, and I'll talk more about how we, how we navigate some of those boundaries. Um, I already told you the other two things. And then the last thing I would add is that um, our family therapists are also present in all our case conferences, treatment team meetings. Um, sometimes we'll do joint sessions if we feel it's appropriate so the family therapist and the individual therapist will meet with the whole family, including the primary client. So it's not like we totally keep them apart all the time, but we're just having some clear boundaries around it. Um, so the work changes depending on the phase of treatment. We'll go into more detail about that a little bit later. But what I'm suggesting to you is to kind of flip the frame upside down. That addiction is a disease of the entire family that manifests not solely from the individual who has a genetic predisposition or engaged in early use or made bad choices or got into particular substances, but actually emerges as a symptom of other problems that are happening in the family. It's really rare to have a family come in with somebody who's got an active addiction and have that be the only problem in the family. There's almost always other stuff going on because we're human. There's stuff going on in all our families. And so we see substance abuse as one manifestation of that. Um, it's happened in the context of family relationships, and you can't make it better unless you also improve those family relationships. Everybody has a part to play, and everybody's got work to do. This does not remove responsibility from the chemically dependent person for doing their own work. Even if it's not their fault that they ended up addicted, it's their responsibility to do something about it. So we're not trying to absolve them of that. We're just trying to destigmatize it and kind of spread out um, Get rid of the blame, actually. Um, anything else I want to add about that? Obviously, it doesn't always happen that way. Some families are harder to engage than others. I have wires falling on my feet. That makes me a little nervous, but OK. Um, so sometimes families have treatment fatigue. Sometimes families live far away. We, we do do a fair amount of work over VC, which is a HIPAA-compliant version of Skype. So we can bring in family members who live in other parts of the country. Um, they don't always engage, but we always make an effort to engage them. So mid-afternoon slump prevention, because I know it's hard to sit still and listen to somebody else. I can't do it. Like I just start to go crazy. Think for a minute about a problem that you had in your adolescence or early adulthood. 
some significant thing that came up during that developmental period for you. And then raise your hand when you've got one in mind. I'm not gonna pick, I'm not gonna ask you to share it. I just wanna make sure people have had a chance to think of it before I tell you the next step. <laughs> I know, sorry, should have said that. <laughs> Rookie error. <laughs> Okay, so most people, it seems, have one. Okay, so think about how you handled that problem, how you dealt with it, what you did to get through it. And now, on a scale of one being no family involvement to 10 being like maximum your whole family was involved, how would you rate the level of support and assistance that you got in solving that problem on a scale of one to 10? Anyone wanna? Zero? Three, yep. Anyone else? Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's not, that's not uncommon, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons that we do this work the way that we do. Now imagine for a minute if you could move that score a little bit closer to 10. Imagine for a minute that you had, let's say, parents that you could talk openly to about what you were struggling with, or a grandparent who was a healthy, role model and steady presence for you, or siblings who really had your back and really looked out for you and tried to advocate for you and help you navigate things. Think about how this would have been different for you in dealing with that problem. And then think about that in the context of how it plays out in addiction. So as, as a sort of crude example, the metaphor doesn't translate perfectly, but if you picture a family in their house, it's late in the evening, everybody's home, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a giant tree falls on the house. And there's one person in the kitchen, which is where the tree really hits, and a couple of people in the dining room where there's some damage done, and then a couple of people in the living room where basically they escape any physical harm, but obviously it's a pretty traumatic thing to have a tree fall on your house. No family would turn around and be like, bummer for you that you were in the kitchen. Good luck fixing that, right? But that's kind of what we do with addiction. And addiction has a strong genetic component. It, it's not somebody's fault that they have that. And yet we often act like it's their fault that they became addicted and it's their job to fix it. And it's our job maybe to fix the rest of the house, but whatever injuries they have, call yourself an ambulance, get to the hospital, get your broken bones fixed, whatever it is. So if we think about addiction as a sort of tree crashing on the house and think about how we would respond differently if that's actually the frame that we were in. At first, so at first glance, when you think of an addict in a family, this is what it looks like, right? It's the one who's not going along with how things are supposed to be, unable to follow directions, unable to get the simple things right, always got to be different, always got to be the problem. But what's wrong with this picture? First of all, why are you in the middle of the road? And where is everybody else? So really, the whole family's in the middle of the road, and we're all walking in different directions, and we've got to figure out how to get everybody going in the same direction and out of the middle of the road where they can get hit by a giant red bus that's driving the wrong way and get them back onto the sidewalk where it's safe. So as an example of this, I'm going to show you a case that we... Oh, that's interesting. This ended up in different order. Okay. Show you a case that we worked with at Freedom Institute. Um, call them the Smith family, obviously that's not their real names. And the primary client was a 21-year-old male named Jack, um, who was an opiate addict. Are, are people, is anyone not familiar with how genograms work and what the little symbols mean? I'm happy to do a quick refresher, okay. So this family came to us, and it was a family where we required the parents to come in for the assessment of the 21-year-old. He was an opiate addict. Um, the family discovered he had an opiate problem when they were on vacation in the Caribbean. And true to good addict form, he had packed enough opiates for his entire vacation. But guess what happened? No, luckily, somehow he managed to get through the search luggage part, which gives me nightmares to the day. He, he ran out. He blew through it in the first half of the vacation, and suddenly it's gone, right? Not surprising to anyone in this room. So what happens? He doesn't know how to cop because he's in this foreign country in some resort. He has no idea where to get more, and he goes into withdrawal. 
So they take him to a doctor, doctor recognizes what's happening, so they put him into detox, and then they ship him back to the US and put him in inpatient treatment. So this family was shocked beyond words. Um, he's, he was about halfway through college when he came to us. He's sort of the golden boy in the family, good student, excellent athlete, had been captain of his high school lacrosse team, involved in all the activities, blah, blah, blah. Um, engaged in some alcohol and pot use, mostly alcohol use in high school, which his parents knew about, probably not the extent of it, but um, particularly his father had this sort of work hard, play hard attitude, and boys will be boys, we're not going to worry about it, this is what kids do. Um, he continued his partying when he got to college, but he also continued to be pretty functional, pretty successful, until the fall um, semester of his second year in college, he sustained a shoulder injury playing sports, and he had to have surgery. And one of the things that we're seeing, is they're clamping down on it now, but one of the things that we've seen in the US, which I'm sure most of you have heard about, is this rampant overprescribing of opiates. So he had surgery on his shoulder, immediately gets a script for 30 Oxycontin, goes through those much sooner than he should have, gets another refill, gets another refill, at which point the doctor says, I'm not giving you any more refills, but he's hooked. So then he starts buying them on from his friends and buying them online. Um, that lasted for a couple of months, and then that just got too difficult and too expensive, and so he switched to heroin. So he came to us um, after a 30-day inpatient stay, um, and prior to that, he'd had several months of heroin use, but he was snorting. He had not yet progressed to IV heroin use. Um, the drug use had become a tremendous source of conflict in the family between his parents, partly because his dad was sort of, well, you, you can't do drugs anymore, but drinking is fine. You can just go back to drinking. Um, his sisters were resentful because his problem, bless you, had sort of taken up all the air in the room and their issues were getting ignored. And the family had made some pretty dramatic changes to their summer plans because they had just spent a huge chunk of money on an expensive inpatient treatment program. Um, so that's sort of a typical way you might see it at intake. What we do is take it up a level and do a genogram that backs up generations to look at other things that might be going on in the family. So what's the first thing you notice? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Some mental health in previous generations. Yep. It's a so it's actually a sober um, uncle. Uh huh. Yep. So addiction running in the family. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Yep. So as we got to know more about this family, and there were some questions early on about the amount which Jack Sr. drinks, um, which is not surprising, we often see that. We've actually had a, a pretty significant proportion of parents going to treatment after they initially bring their kids into treatment. Um, but he was a heavy drinker, so we found out that his brother was an alcoholic in recovery and had concerns about his drinking. Um, mom, who was very anxious, very worried, and sort of overprotective of this kid, and did a lot of things that would t typically be labeled um, codependent or enabling with him, she had grown up in a family, this chart is actually missing a line, but she had grown up in a family where her mother died of an overdose, which the, the kids didn't know, the mom knew, was actually a su probably a suicide. She'd been addicted to sleeping pills. Dad remarried shortly after that, so grandfather remarried, and the new stepmom did not get along well with either of the, the two kids from the original marriage. So her brother started showing symptoms of depression and becoming alcoholic at a pretty young age. And because they were sort of the two survivors of their mother's death and didn't feel particularly included in the new family dynamic, they really sort of bonded together. So she had spent a lot of her life really taking care of and looking out for her brother, who at the point that Jack came into treatment was not doing so well. So her anxiety was really amped up by her experiences with her brother, and her patterns with her son were heavily informed by what she'd seen and experienced with her brother, and by her fears about losing another family member to an overdose, which may or may not. It wasn't ever concluded that it was a suicide, but it looked like a suicide. Um, and then dad, who's a heavy drinker, has got this brother who's sober. Turns out his father was alcoholic, ex-military, tough guy, macho guy, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, what's all this feelings crap, very kind of toxic masculinity, which is then helped explain why Jack Sr. 
had the attitudes that he did about Jack Jr. Like, just get it together, man. What do you, what do you need all this treatment for? Stay away from the drugs. You just need a little more willpower, right? But you can see, once you see how those patterns trace down through the generations, it really takes a little bit of the heat off the immediate family. Because suddenly, Jack isn't the only person with a substance use problem. So it's not just there's something wrong with him. It's he's gotten an unlucky dip in the gene pool, and he's got this disease that has come down through his family. Mom's worrying, over-anxious, over-protective behavior suddenly gets defined differently when you see the magnitude of the losses that she's experienced. Dad's sort of harsh behavior is seen differently when you see the environment that he grew up in. He didn't really ever have a chance to learn sort of a softer, more relational way of being. So when you explore the family relationships and you start looking at the patterns of how people relate to each other and how the patterns get carried on, it really gives you something different to focus on than just the addiction. So suddenly the addiction is one of the problems in the family and you can take a step back from it and it takes a little bit of the power away. And then you can start working on things that help strengthen the family relationships, which then puts everybody in a better place to address the addiction. Miss anything there? Yep, that's it, okay. So common scenarios we see when families come in, um, the stakes are really high, especially now with the level of opiates that we're seeing. And families are constantly <coughs> getting advice and instruction from friends, other family members, people working in the field about how they should handle things. And yet there's always this feeling that you can't get it right because no matter what you do, this person is still addicted. Um, pretty common to see an overanxious mother and a sort of distant or nonchalant father. Sometimes we see a rageful parent that doesn't always come out until you do the genogram and start looking at the relationships and what's happening in the relationships. Resentful siblings are siblings who work really hard to be perfect. Um, yeah? Can I just ask where you get the information from? The family therapist, yep, good question, thank you. The family therapist sits down or stands up. With, usually we use those big sticky post-it notes on the <coughs> wall and just starts mapping it out and can then explore themes and make notes about other things besides substance abuse that have shown up in the family. So again, it takes a little bit of the focus off the addict and spreads out the opportunities for what the family can do to get healthier. And they'll keep it and they'll pull it out in subsequent sessions and make more notes on it or make another one to go up another generation. Um, some of them, in some families, it's really fascinating. You can go way back and see where things come in other families. Yep, yep, absolutely, yeah. So it, family doesn't just have to be immediate family. In a lot of families, you've got a grandparent who's actively involved or living with the family. You've got a cousin who's close. You've got other people. So uh, really, we, so we sort of define family as anyone that's important to the client. It doesn't just have to be the nuclear family. We'll do the genogram based on the nuclear family, but then we'll sort of do scribbles on the sides to include other people. Um, Perfect siblings, so in the case of Jack Jr., his older sister, when things were going wrong at family gatherings, like if Jack was showing, hadn't shown up yet and was late, and so mom starts to get anxious, dad starts to get angry, older sister goes into perfect mode because she wants everybody else to think the family's still doing okay, and so she's running around eagerly kind of trying to engage everybody and be cheerful and show how well things are going. Younger sister was developing an eating disorder, which was completely getting ignored because there was so much concern about the substance use disorder. And again, when you start mapping things out, you start being able to see that. Um, already mentioned not uncommon to see a substance abusing parent. Also not uncommon to see undiagnosed mental health issues in parents. Uh, we see a lot of adopted kids. A lot of our primary clients with addiction <laughs> issues, which speaks to the early attachment trauma and um, sort of relational component of the disease. Um, and then obviously, you know, it's pretty common to see divorced parents and family histories. Sorry, just with the adopted kids, if they can't do the genogram because they don't have the information from the family? Well, they don't have the biological information always, but they do have, the, they're bringing in their adoptive family, so they've got that information. Yeah, but that's a good point. That's a good point. Yes. It's a big risk, and, and that's actually one of the things um, 
in my little sort of evaluation notes at the end, it is a risk and it can get really chaotic and it's pretty grueling for the clinicians, which is why they've had three and four years of postgraduate training. It's, it is complicated. So the, sh the short answer is it would take a lot more time to go into all of that, but the, the simpler answer is, um, or I guess that's the long answer, the simpler answer is part of the, the aim of this way of working is to leverage the existing strengths in the family. So the family therapist isn't just assuming responsibility for everything that's happening in the room. So for example, with the, the um, information about the younger sister developing an eating disorder, yeah, we do address that. And so <coughs> there can be a separate family session about that that maybe is just her and the parents, and we get her connected with an eating disorder treatment program, as, as one example. But it can get chaotic. Part of We'll talk about relational techniques in just a minute. There are ways that you can kind of manage that chaos, um, but it can be tricky and it doesn't work with every family. I'm not saying like everybody should do everything this way. It is complicated. And especially in families where you see people with pretty um, pronounced personality disorders that can get tricky. If you've got family members who are really emotionally dysregulated, sometimes you just can't have everybody in the room at the same time. Um, so some of the techniques though that we use to manage that um, coming from this strengths-based framework, really we approach it collaboratively and we want to recognize family expertise. So <clears throat> no, the family does not know, they're not experts on substance use, but they're experts on what their substance user does around their use. They're experts on who has rage fits in the family, who's prone to depression, what communication patterns happen between different family members when things aren't going well. They're the experts on all that. And also they're the experts on getting themselves this far. So we don't want to overly pathologize the family and treat them like they're these helpless failures and we have to come in as the experts and sort of pronounce from on high what they should be doing. We really look at it as building on their expertise and expanding their competence to help them leverage whatever the presenting issue is to strengthen their relationships and then go on to solve other problems. Um, we're pretty transparent. So if a therapist, for instance, in this case, the family therapist had a working hypothesis that um, dad's sort of nonchalance and distance from the problem and mom's over anxiousness and over involvement in the problem were kind of a circular feedback loop. And so part of mom's over involvement and over anxiety had to do with her experiences with her brother but part of it was in response to her husband because she felt like if he's not paying enough attention and doing enough to support this kid, I better step up and do it because I don't want him to die. Somebody's got to do it. And so the therapist was able to throw that out as a hypothesis in a non-pathologizing way like, hey dad, you grew up in this kind of tough family where you fix it yourself and you use willpower and you do things and don't fuss too much over people. Mom, you grew up in a family where you were really fussing and taking care of somebody. So those are very different styles. And my theory is that those two styles kind of activate each other and perpetuate a cycle that's actually not very helpful for your son. And so I'm wondering if we could look at a different way for the two of you to approach this problem and maybe move closer together on that spectrum we showed you earlier so that you're more in sync. Um, there's one down here. So, and I'm just going to jump ahead for a second. Finding positive stories or feelings. So again, enhancing the family strength. So one of the things we did with this family, back before Jack got into, really got into his substance use, he and dad used to like golfing together. So one of the first things that we recommended was go golf again. We had to convince dad not to stop and drink at the ninth hole. But um, just spending time together and being able to connect in a way that wasn't just around the substance use started to reform their attachment in a way that also got dad more involved in being concerned about this kid and gave mom more space to back off. So it got them a little bit off that merry-go-round. Um, going up a generation when we really run into a jam about sort of being able to solve a problem, sometimes we'll take a step back and say, well, what did this look like in the generation before you? How did you learn to respond to these things? How did you, what were the messages you got or what things did you see in your family of origin that might be affecting your beliefs and your ways of responding this, to this today? We all internalize beliefs from our early attachments about how to be in relationship, how to protect ourselves, how to respond to other people, being able to pull out some of those beliefs. So for instance, for dad in this case, to really examine um, his sort of be tough, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, bootstraps, use your willpower, 
and the origins of that and how deeply that played into how he responded to Jack and also how deeply it formed how he related to his wife and how little emotional support he allowed anyone to give him. Um, circular questions, those are questions that are um, designed to look at the ways people connect and are alike and the ways that people are distinct from one another. And they're all about the relationship rather than the particular presenting problem. So as one example, um, a question might be to ask, um, not ask mom, why are you so anxious? But ask, say, one of the sisters, when does mom get anxious? When does it show up? And what do others in the family do when that happens? So that's an example of a circular or relational question. So it's getting the family to focus on the relationship qualities and how they connect and identify and are the same and how they're distinct from each other, rather than just focusing specifically, again, on the substance use. Um, the, um, sorry, was something else I was going to add about that. Oh, the other advantage of circular questioning is oftentimes what happens in a family is everybody's waiting for the substance dependent person to start making changes and kind of sitting back like, well, when is this going to happen? Prove it to me, scrutinizing, playing detective, kind of watching. Circular questioning allows other family members to recognize that they have work to do too and that there are things that they can change. And it doesn't all have to be about the substance use. So rather than sit back and wait for sort of the chemically dependent person to prove that they're working hard enough or prove that they do it, it causes them to have to look at themselves and get to work. Um, we also externalizing, somewhere on that list, yeah, reframing or externalizing the problem. So again, to go back to worry, rather than having worry just be mom's issue, talk about worry as something that happens in the family. Um, where does it show up? Where, what impact does it have? What does it do to the rest of your time together as a family? Not just about mom, but about worry as kind of a separate thing. Same thing with the addiction. What things did you enjoy together before substance use got in the way, rather than before Jack started using substances? Um, what else? Both and, um, did I, skip? I skipped some of these. So tracking other dynamics besides the presenting problem, we've sort of talked about that. Normalizing and depathologizing responses, that's part of the education that we do with families that most programs do. And then both and thinking. So for example, <clears throat> it is possible or likely that a kid who is abused will also love their parent. Both things can be possible. They're seemingly opposite things, but actually they're not. And there are many examples of that in substance abusing families. It is possible for me to be entirely rageful at my alcoholic spouse and entirely afraid of losing him, both and. And we look for that as much as possible. So just back to our sort of treatment flow. Um, with assessment, initial treatment being the first couple of months, usually that's the time that somebody's in the IOP, and then ongoing treatment at least till the first year of sobriety. The family work changes throughout. So at assessment, it's an opportunity for the clinician to observe family dynamics, get multiple perspectives on the presenting issue, and this actually is a lot more surprising than you might think. It's amazing sometimes to hear the difference in how siblings report what happens in a family versus how parents do, or how kids do versus how a spouse does. So having everybody in the room really gives you a lot more clinically rich information. Um, beginning at assessment, right from the very beginning, <coughs> excuse me, beginning psychoeducation about substance use disorder, because again, many families don't know much. Families who are coming from inpatient treatment usually have had some of this, so we can sort of fast forward through it. But a lot, like I said, about half the families that come to us have had zero, so it's our responsibility to do that. Excuse me. Creating space for fa other family members to be open about their concerns. In many families that we see, families are frozen from talking about the issue, either because they're sort of steeped in denial or because they're walking on eggshells and afraid that anything that they do that might cause some upset is going to trigger a relapse, and then they're going to be responsible for it. So creating a safe space and helping them understand that they can bring up those concerns without being responsible for sending somebody else into a nosedive. I um, already talked about this, but getting information on the family history of addiction, mental health issues. Trauma is a big one. Trauma is often not talked about early in treatment. And if you only do an assessment with an individual client, you may or may not hear 
about their own specific individual trauma. But we see a lot of families where there's multi-generational trauma that still has an impact. And a lot of the new neuroscience is actually showing that trauma really does get transmitted from one generation to another. You may not hear about that if you're just assessing an individual client. But if you bring in the family and you start doing that genogram, you start hearing those stories. And then you, you're able to examine the impact that that's having on the family functioning and on the substance use. Um, and then importantly, getting information about family strengths and resources. We always ask about that, again, from, from the perspective of um, treating people as humans who have things to offer the world and aren't just complete abject failures. So initial treatment becomes sort of a challenge to balance the individual treatment, the concerns of the family, with redefining the problem more systemically. Early in treatment, this is tricky because the primary client is often struggling with early sobriety. <coughs> the pink cloud is sort of going away and things are getting real. So there's a little bit of a balancing act that goes on there. Um, we also very early on negotiate practical matters, about, especially about how information will be shared. So for instance, the family will have an open, transparent dialogue about what if there's a relapse or a slip? What if the primary client doesn't show up to group one day? What if they miss an individual appointment? When and how do things get communicated to families without infantilizing the identified patient, but making sure that families are in the loop and that our clinical team is not in the position of keeping secrets? Um, expanding family resources, internal and external. So helping the family learn how to communicate better, helping the family learn each person sort of how to manage their own emotions, how to respond to the primary presenting issue, and then also what external supports do they need? Is, are, have people tried Al-Anon? Does somebody need to be in individual therapy? Does somebody need their own substance use assessment? Does somebody need to take up meditation or yoga or see a psychiatrist or whatever it is? And again, just to sort of beat it, up, beat it to death, the primary client is the family as a whole. It's the family relationships. It is not the substance abuser. Ongoing treatment, we try to challenge families, identify ways that they get stuck focusing on the addict and get them off that a little bit. Expand the conversation beyond just the addiction and the responses to the addiction, because there is a tendency for families to want to return to that, understandably, because that was the presenting issue. When they come in, they're so worried, and they've had so many tough experiences around it. Making room for multiple perspectives, revisiting the problem definition, and really trying to get blame off the table altogether. Looking at family boundaries, and we all know this is a big thing in substance abuse, so this is a constant, ongoing sort of navigation process. Um, helping the families find ways <coughs> to connect even in times of stress is really important because a family that can stay connected to each other provides a much more fertile soil for somebody to sort of grow their recovery. And people are much more motivated to do what they need to do if they feel positive connection to each other, at least some of the time. And then helping them identify and reclaim parts of family relationships that have gone missing because their worry or their substance abuse or the responses to the substance abuse have gotten in the way of the relationship. So the example I gave about Jack and his dad, they used to really enjoy a lot of sports things together. That all disappeared at a certain point. So reclaiming that and reestablishing that actually became an important part of their recovery. Perhaps the most impactful thing we do um, where we get kind of the most, oh yeah, Sure. You know, I just said, you know, reconnecting to the family and, and sort of, you know, helping the family members with this or that. And, you know, I, I do a lot of couple work and sort of just even mentioning one thing to the one person or whatever and just to just to get people to open up and to think about it. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. Because I know that's one of the biggest things that you know, people struggle with is that they don't want to talk about it. Yeah, it's Yeah, I mean, there's, there are other specific techniques you can use around that. I mean, with, so just as not to put you on the spot, but when you're doing couples work, are you doing a genogram? So that actually can be really a powerful tool because what you can start looking at is how each person in the couple learned to be in a relationship, what they learned about attachment, what they learned about trust, what they learned about independence, what they learned about boundaries, what they learned about who's responsible for what. And you start seeing, if you go up a generation or two, you start seeing where those patterns came from. So when the, then when the conflict arises in the room, you can refer back to that and it defuses it a little bit. So that's one example. With couples work, there's also this thing called the vulnerability cycle, which I don't have time to completely explain, but you can look it up. Um, 
where basically we all have beliefs and themes that we hang on to about relationships. And we all have ways that we've developed to sort of survive and protect ourselves. And we often pair with people whose survival strategies trigger our vulnerabilities. And so it becomes this feedback loop. And it makes sense if you think about that's sort of why people end up that way together. So if, um, what's a good example? If my survival strategy is I don't need anybody, I'm not asking anybody for anything, I'm not going to be vulnerable. And one of my husband's vulnerabilities is he needs to feel needed or doesn't like feeling shut out or excluded. Whenever something comes up that's a potential problem in the relationship, he's going to seek to not be excluded and to be needed and to be part of it. And I'm going to react by trying to be distant and not vulnerable and be independent. And it just becomes this spiral. So helping them identify some of those patterns too. Um, and also naming it, like do, we name blame and we say, you know what, this, this blaming, that, that, is, this, that sounds like you're blaming them. And really, this isn't anybody's fault. Everybody's played a part in this. And it doesn't really matter whose fault it is. It's whether or not you're going to take the responsibility to do something differently. But it is, it's tricky. It's loaded, especially with families where you've got We've got a lot of times what we'll see with families when they're coming in is marriages have really been frayed by either one of the couples substance abuse problem or the substance abuse problem of one of the, the kids and it gets really complicated. It's it's it can be a time bomb. Uh, it sounds as there is had a lot of work for therapists, you know, to discuss the dynamic in a family mm -hmm. uh, when you're going for uh, through the history of the family. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I, I wonder, you know, the ratio of uh, psychoeducation and therapy, the how much attention you pay uh, about the uh, psychodynamic of the family mm -hmm. in a psychoeducation treatment, I mean, a psychoeducation sessions, mm -hmm. and how much you kind of how maybe how do you incorporate all that and how you share it between psychoeducation and treatments uh -huh. as treatments? Uh -huh. It's a lot um, and it's tricky, and I think the balance shifts depending on the family. Typically, if we go back to that earlier. More of the psychoeducation is happening in the assessment and the initial treatment process. And as, as you move on in treatment, there's less of a need for that and you can focus more on the family dynamics. But it is, it's, a, it's a balance and it's not, there's not an exact science to it. It's more of an art than a science, really. Um, there are also ways that family members can get that psychoeducation outside of the therapy. Al-Anon or you know, is a great spot for that. There's books that we recommend for families. The Family Recovery Guide is a good one. So there's a lot of places where they can get some of that so it doesn't necessarily have to take place in the room. And then in the room, they can focus on some of the other things. Sometimes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Clients are doing homework as part of their DBT work. So, yeah. Did somebody else? Oh, yeah. I was wondering, what do you do when you have a mother who, um, or a father who's a, uh, coming in for as the CD? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what happens then it, with um, looking after the children? Is mm -hmm. there a specific thing for that? Depends on the ages of the children. I mean, we will take kids. We will include kids in family therapy if they're like five and up. Mm -hmm. um, typically, the families we see don't have a lot of young kids. Um, when we see families with young kids, it's more often moms. Interestingly, I don't know why that is. Yeah. Um, and so the therapist will make some decisions about when to when it's safe for the kids for the kids to be included, and when it makes more sense to just work with the couple. Um, again, not an exact science. There are a few places on the East Coast in the U.S. that do specific children's programming, and we'll sometimes refer to those where you can take the kids down and do like a full all-day program with the kids that's right. very structured and regimented. Um, but in the work that we're doing, it's really focusing more on having healthy boundaries um, between what's going on in the adult relationship and not sort of putting too much on the kids and fostering the attachment and the connection. Yeah. And also preventing the dynamic where 
one parent is sort of trying to control the other parent's access to the kids. Yeah, yeah. Because so. if it's all, um, I'm just thinking from like an ACOA perspective, mm -hmm. um, that and, and from a trauma perspective as well, that if it is true that it's passed down behaviorally, a lot of this stuff, I mean, I know having a codependent parent in recovery uh, who hadn't looked at their childhood trauma stuff, it was still enough for underlying stuff to go down the mm -hmm. ranks because <clears throat> there was... I wasn't put in therapy mm -hmm. when I was seven. Mm -hmm. There is no thing for that. And I wonder if there, if there is a way of specifically getting involved with them as well. Um, yeah, well, I mean, in part of looking at the relationships in the family, you're looking at the relationships with the kids too. And this is really just the beginning. I mean, we're talking about people's first few months or first year of recovery. And so that's something that would be happening sort of further down the right. line when the family's in yeah. a very different place. And the other question sure. I had was, um, do you help the parents with, um, or at least with the other family members, in how they talk to the therapist and how they then talk? Do they gain like a language where they can, when they're away from the therapist, they can speak to each other? Mm -hmm. um, because I know that it can also be difficult if a parent suddenly turns around and says, oh, let's talk about our feelings all the time, mm -hmm. whereas actually they're coming at it from a codependent perspective. Yep. Um, and that's not necessarily safe for the child to, to share their feelings, even though the parent's going, hey, it's fine, let's talk right. about it. Well, that's part of why you get everybody in the room together, because then you can also see how that goes and help the parents develop some boundaries around that and help the kids recognize their own boundaries around that. Cool. Thank you. I've got a very quick question. Uh, how resistant are the families to doing this particular process? It really varies. Um, some families are completely resistant. Some families um, are ambivalent. And some families, once they get a taste of what it really means, are in it 100%. So, so many times when families come in, the relationships have been so fractured by the substance use and there's so much sense of sort of blame and shame and failure that sitting in a room with somebody who says, this isn't your fault, you're a good person, you have strengths here in your family to work on, we actually have a lot of hope for you all being able to work on this together and all feel better together is tremendously validating. And the multifamily group, which I'm going to talk about next, is actually a really powerful tool for that. Uh, just because I work with families in eating disorders, and this message of codependency is very difficult to get across. They are hugely, hugely resistant to it. Well, it, it's our family therapists are actually allergic to the word codependent. They right. don't use that word and they don't use enabling because that's sort of pathologizing what is actually behavior that arose understandably from some crazy circumstances. And so what they'll talk about instead is um, worrying too much or sacrificing your own interests and your own care for taking care of somebody else, but in a way that's less pathologizing because it's less shaming to people and it's easier for people to then identify and accept that that's what they're doing. Yes, that's very useful because actually we've been searching for <laughs> another word because we don't like it ourselves. Yeah, it's funny because in, so I mean, we've got a, a treatment team that comes from a variety of different approaches and especially early in the early days of having family therapists and we'd be sitting in like one of our treatment team meetings and one of the more psych psychodynamically trained people or one of the sort of traditional 12 step, you know, always been in recovery people would say something about a codependent parent and you'd see our family therapists like start to twitch because it's just, they just, it, they're allergic to it. So it's really helped all of us frame, and DBT has done this too, I mean DBT takes a really non-pathologizing frame that one of the core assumptions you have to agree to to be part of a DBT team is that everybody's doing the best they can and everybody wants to get better and there's the, you have to balance the dialectic between accepting yourself for who you are and valuing yourself for who you are and changing the things about yourself that need to be changed. And so we really try to come from that framework in all the work that we do and I think it's been really good for us as clinicians too, personally, just in doing the work. Yeah, it's tricky though. Um, so I just want to talk about our multifamily group format because this is something that I think is exportable and it's amazingly powerful. I wish I could show you all like a video of it. but <coughs> So when we do multifamily group, um, 
how we set it up, and everyone who comes into our intensive outpatient program is told at the time of admission to the program that there's a multifamily group session as part of the program. So the expectation is created right from the beginning. Um, as you can imagine, it creates a fair amount of apprehension and anxiety, which we try and kind of talk people through. And then what we do is the family therapists go into um, the IOP one day, and they take in a form for the clients to fill out, or the clients do it with their individual therapists, about who's in their family and who they might like to invite to this day. Um, and then we suggest to the clients that they let their family members know that they're invited to do this. And the family therapists reach out to the family member. We get a signed release, obviously. And the family therapists reach out to the family members and say, want you to know this is part of our IOP treatment program. It's coming up in three weeks or two weeks or whatever it is. Um, and we'd like you to come and attend with so-and-so. And so there's a direct connection and a direct invitation to the family that isn't just dependent on the client. Um, some clients don't want their families there. They're pretty adamant about it. Some families don't want to come. But by and large, uh, because our family therapists are so experienced with this, they know how to explain it in a way that's less threatening to the clients and their families and to get them to come. So <clears throat> they show up for one day of treatment. So it's a morning. We do, it's a three-hour morning group. So the family members come. The um, family therapists go in, and they're sort of the facilitators for the day. And the four pieces of the multifamily group, they go through what the goals are for the day. They do introductions. They do some psychoeducation around sort of the common situations that come up in families where substance abuse is a presenting issue. And again, many of the families um, have not had this because their, their primary patient has not been in, in patient care. And then they do a group within a group. So the goals listed here, um, and again, in the in the um, spirit of transparency that our family therapists work in, we tell the families, we want to normalize for you how substance abuse impacts families, because we think you're going to find that a lot of what you've experienced has also been experienced by other people in this room. We're going to highlight the importance of connecting as a family and helping families remember what it felt like when they were more connected to each other or identify with the longing that they have to be more connected if they haven't been well connected before. Begin to make room for multiple perspectives in the room without blame or a need for sort of fighting about who's right or who's wrong. We can agree to disagree. We might have different perspectives on that, this or that thing. It's OK. And begin to identify and perhaps reclaim parts of the family relationship that have gone missing um, because of worry or because of substance use. So we have the um, CD identifying patients sitting on one side of the room, and we have all the family members sitting on the other side of the room. And then the individual primary patients who are already in this IOP group and already all know each other because they've been in group together for however long. And it varies because we do rolling admission. So at the time that we do the multifamily group, some clients may only have been in IOP for a week and some may be close to completing. But it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it works the same either way. So the primary client, the IOP member, introduces the family members that are there and also identifies who else is in their family that isn't there that day. So they sort of give them a placeholder in the room, even if they couldn't or wouldn't come. They then have to identify what substances brought them there, what they're in treatment for. And then they talk about or list at least one of their family's strengths. And maybe it's we have a good sense of humor. Maybe it's we're resilient. Maybe it's we're all really smart. Doesn't matter what it is. They just have to identify a strength. After that, we go into <coughs> excuse me the psychoeducation part of it. Um, and so the family therapists educate the family about how substance abuse hijacks family functioning, talk about sort of the investigator, detective role that tends to happen in families where you end up with at least one other person in the family who takes on responsibility for monitoring the identified patient's sobriety, right? And like always kind of checking and double checking and trying to figure out and make sure and are they really doing it and have they relapsed and is there a relapse coming? <coughs> the hypervigilance of that and also how clients feel so scrutinized by that and so not trusted and um, devalued like they're, they aren't going to get well, they can't be trusted to get well. Um, <coughs> clients, another dynamic clients, often feel blamed in the family because of their substance abuse. And interestingly, when you get in the room with families, 
often the identified patient felt blamed for family problems before the substance use even started. When you think about sort of those typical roles that we hear about, you know, the scapegoat and the perfect child and all of that, those exist for a reason. And oftentimes the person who develops the substance use in the family is sort of the one who's in charge of acting out the family problems. <coughs> um, family members, the um, avoidance that happens where family members avoid not only talking about the substance abuse, but avoid doing anything that might be upsetting to the person who's in early recovery because they don't want to trigger a relapse. Normalizing that for families can be a tremendous relief for them. And um, talking about the mixed messages that families get about how connected they should be, how detached they should be, how much they should be involved, how much support they should give, how much support they shouldn't give. Um, the lack of acknowledgement that often families feel, the person in recovery feeling not acknowledged because they feel like the family doesn't recognize how hard they're working and how hard this really is. And family members feeling not acknowledged for all the work they've done and all they've put up with up to even get to this point. Um, the way other family problems get ignored, again, really common. So it kind of takes some of the shame away from a family because oftentimes when a problem's being ignored, in the back of their minds, family members know, uh-oh, we've also got this thing that we're ignoring. And so being able to say, that's pretty normal for that to happen can be a tremendous relief. And then how families sort of stop being able to have fun together once substance abuse comes in and takes over. And then we get to the group within a group. And so what happens here is we start with um, the individual clients and we ask them each, they take turns, what do you feel your family members do not see or understand about you because substance abuse has gotten in the way? It could be something that's related to the substance abuse or it could be something totally just about them as a person. So they no longer see how smart I am. They no longer see how successful I've been or I could be. They no longer see how caring I am. They no longer see how funny I am. And then we have the other family members also take turns to answer the same question. So. Um, they, they forget how fun I am. They forget how much I've done for them. They don't see how I have my own career and my own life and I'm a person outside of my job taking care of this family. Or they don't see how I'm actually also a very caring and dedicated parent and not just always you know, the, the enforcer and the disciplinarian. And just the process of going through this and families sharing with each other is amazingly powerful. And the amount of compassion and acknowledgement and support and unconditional love that comes out is really, it's mind blowing. Um, it's really powerful for people to hear from other people's families as well. It might be hard for me to hear from my mother how she feels so unacknowledged for all that she's done for me as I've been raging through this crazy addiction. But when I hear three other people's mothers talk about it or three other people's spouses talk about it, it's easier for me to sort of ingest that. And um, it, it really makes an impact for the people in early recovery to feel recognized and validated for the work that they're doing by their family members. And, and it's so empowering for them. Another question that you can do for a group with a, within a group or you can actually do in a family therapy session, in what ways do you, does the CD person struggle with wanting or not wanting family support? Because again, there's a lot of ambivalence. We go back to that sort of spectrum idea. Sometimes you want them to do everything for you. Sometimes you don't want to be infantilized. Um, and then for the family members, in what ways do you struggle with whether or not to step in? Because this is a thing that families really wrestle with, right? So should I make sure he gets to his psychiatrist appointment? Should I help her find a ride to a meeting? Should I pay this bill that's overdue? Should I make sure she gets to her therapy appointment? All of these things that um, become sources of such conflict for the family. So typically what we see before the multifamily group, we're not really in a lot of contact with the families a lot of times. Sometimes they're in family therapy, but sometimes not. Um, so the primary clients typically are very anxious and very fearful, and they'll talk a lot about it in process group part of IOP about how nervous they are for this day because in their minds what's going to happen is they're going to sit in the center of the room and all the families are going to come and sit around them and tell them what terrible people they are and all the ways that they've failed, right? That's, that's what's happening in their heads. Um, during the multifamily group, it's really amazing. Even like 
my most seasoned clinicians <coughs> talk about being blown away by the level of warmth and compassion and unconditional love that families are showing for each other during the course of this conversation and the level of validation that families feel by recognizing their experience in other people's experiences. And then afterwards, um, clients and families both report feeling much more cared for rather than mistrusted. So if you're trying to help me with something, it's not because you think I can't do it, it's because you care about me and you see how hard I'm working and you want, you want to help me. Um, <coughs> feeling supported, acknowledged, the judgment and blame sort of goes out the door and families start inkling, but they start to feel more connected and more hopeful. And in a number of cases, what then happens is the family is more willing to do that family work that we were, the question that you were asking before about sort of how resistant or willing are families to do this. When they do an experience like that, this, it increases their engagement and their willingness to engage because they get a very different understanding of what family therapy is really going to be about. Um, so everything is perfect until it's not. This all sounds amazing, right? Difficult, yes, but amazing. Um, on a positive note, we see better sustained recovery for individual clients when their families are involved, and particularly by doing this relational work rather than the more sort of separate coaching everybody work. Um, families are more connected and less isolated. We consistently have families come back and report to us that their relationships have never been as good as they are now even before the substance use happened. Um, we even, even, well, this is kind of a downer, but it just came to my mind. One case in particular, we had this young man who was with us for a couple of years. He was an opiate user, and um, the family did a lot of work. They had a tremendous family therapist, and they did a lot of work, and it was really a tough case. And the sad part is um, he had a relapse and died immediately because it was an opiate relapse. And in spite of that, his parents came back to see the family therapist and to thank her because they said, I get teary just thinking about this family, they said that the relationships and connection that they had had with him in his two years of recovery were so much better than anything they had had in his 25 years of life prior to that and that they were so grateful even though they had this tragic loss and he died, they were so grateful that they were able to repair their relationships before he died and have that be what they were left with rather than the ravages of when he entered treatment. And that's kind of a bad example to give you because he didn't survive, but we see a lot of families where it really does help people's recovery. And it helps, it makes the family stronger for dealing with relapse because relapse is so often a part of recovery. And if you've done the family work and the family continues to do work and be connected to each other, they've got tools, the strength of their relationships gives them leverage, and they're much better prepared to cope and stop relapses when they happen rather than entering back into the same patterns and the same spirals they were in before. Yes, oops, sorry. Just, just to tie into that note, has any research been done, if we're talking about looking at genograms and uh, histories of addiction and alcoholics being sober, the effects of future generations of families who've had family work? Does that make sense? Is that something yeah, no, you that, think that, about? I mean, we think about it. One of the, so one of the challenges of this work is there is very little research done. So I'm not aware of that. Um, entirely possible, but I'm not aware of it. We, we wish that there was more research. We've tried to look at doing a little bit of research, but to do good research is really expensive, and we haven't figured out a way to fund that yet. Um, the Ackerman Institute, where our family therapists were trained, has done some research around this stuff. There's a gentleman by the name of Peter Steinglass who's written about it, and actually he and the two family therapists that I showed you from our team have an article coming out in a journal soon about the multifamily group work in um, substance abusing families. So, you know, hopefully there will end up being more, but um, my mouse disappeared. That's interesting. But um, that's not what I'm trying to do. But at this point, I don't think there's a lot. Um, the other challenge of doing the kind of family work that we do is it's expensive. So, like I said, we're in Midtown Manhattan. Our real estate is just like London real estate. It's very expensive. We're able to sustain our programming largely based on group formats. We provide individual therapy as part of our intensive outpatient program and our other groups, but the, sort of what drives the engine economically and keeps us from being, um, keeps us self-sustaining is group work. And you cannot sustain that model well if you're doing a lot of family work because 
a family coming in paying for a family session or us billing insurance for their family session isn't even covering the cost of the floor space they're sitting on for that hour, much less all the other overhead. So, and I'm just trying to be, it's, I'm a straightforward person, I'm just trying to be frank with you, it's a problem, it's tricky. So it's one of the things we're really having to look at now in terms of how we sustain this work. Um, it is hard to get families to engage sometimes. Um, families that do tend to do really well. Some families come and they don't stick at it because it's too much work and they don't want to look at their own issues. We particularly see that with families where we've got a parent who's got a lot of emotional regulation problems, perhaps an undiagnosed mental health issue, and families where the spouse or the parents or you know, whoever the other adults are in the family have their own substance issue that they don't want to look at. And that's often when family treatment will end, um, is when that starts getting too hot. So, um, so it, it, can be, it can be challenging. It's also grueling work. Um, I think you alluded to this when you were talking about the blame earlier. But um, our family, sitting in a room with a family is a lot more stressful than sitting in a room with an individual person, because there's just so much more to manage. And so your caseloads need to be smaller. You need really highly trained professionals and you have to do a lot more to sort of take care of your staff and prevent prevent burnout. Um, you had a question? No, it's one person with a family. The, the time when we have two people is when we do assessments and there's an individual therapist and a family therapist in the room. And we'll sometimes do what we call like treatment team meetings or particularly with young adults where there are a lot of issues around whether or not there is with just one. Yeah, we do. We are really we do a lot of supervision at Freedom Institute. We pay. Oh, the mirror. No, we don't have that. We, they do record. We tape some sessions, so families who are open to that, and the family therapist will tape sessions and then bring it to family supervision. And we pay an outside supervisor to come in and provide supervision for them. And they also do peer supervision. So we use that model. But we don't have the two-way mirror. You know, it's funny, I tried, because we're small, it's hard to get good statistics, and I tried to take a look at that because I knew this question would come up and I haven't looked at it in about a year and a half. It varies hugely. I mean, we've got some families who stick around <clears throat> for a year, year and a half. We've got other families who make it through three or four sessions and they're out. Most commonly what we see is families will continue work until the primary client has finished IOP and do maybe a little bit more another few weeks or a month after that and then sort of phase out. And then what tends to happen though is they come back when things heat up again. So three or four months? Um, I would say two or three months and then, and then they return. Um, do you sell the For IOP, we introduce it at the time of assessment, and for IOP, we've actually just switched to a billing model where we can, they can choose that package or from the get-go. Get mm -hmm. How many of them go to take home family Well, that's part of what happens at the assessment. Yes, exactly. Well, it's included in the price of the assessment. We just do it as a joint assessment, so that's part of it. And then they can have a free family session when somebody's in IOP, so that would be the second opportunity. And then the multifamily group that I just talked about is a third opportunity to engage them and, and sort of help them try to consider the problem from a different lens. So they, most families get sort of three shots at doing that. Yeah, well, we don't treat adolescents. We treat young adults and adults. But um, it, it could be a problem where we're sort of shielded from that is because we use DBT as a core modality in our intensive outpatient program. One of the components of DBT treatment is that clients have to make a commitment to treatment. And so they're not even going to start IOP unless they buy into it, and we're not going to let them start. So if a client is really not interested in being in treatment with us, because their parents chose it or whatever, um, they won't. It won't even get that far for the family to be in beyond the assessment. 
Sure. I was a confused with the multifamily group. Do you include the clients with families? Or yes. Families? No, everyone. And various families? Yep. So typically our IOP, we typically cap it at eight or nine. Occasionally it goes up to 10, but usually it's like seven or eight clients in IOP at one time. Yes, and so, yep, so they all can invite their families in. And even if somebody has a family that doesn't come for whatever reason, they still participate that day because they still actually get a lot out of it just by being in the room with other people's families. Yeah, so it, again, the model is always we're trying to have the identified patient and the family members in the room together as much as possible. The, the only families, the only groups that we have with the families that don't include the the client are the parent group and the significant like significant other spouse group. Um, but otherwise, any family therapy includes everybody. A mm -hmm. um, couple more quick things about sort of what's tricky about this model. Sometimes it's hard to get other providers on board. Um, again, because our industry tends to be pretty fairly steeped in the individual separate from family model, a lot of what happens, a lot of what the ancillary providers are doing with, particularly with families, is sort of goes against what we're trying to do with families. So for instance, we'll get a family where there's a recovery coach involved and the recovery coach is, is saying to the parents, well, you need to create a boundary and don't even talk to him for two months, which obviously isn't work gonna work if we're trying to have the family in therapy together. So sometimes it's a challenge to get other providers on board. We've put a couple of things in our model to help with that, including some multi-provider case conference work that happens on the telephone. Um, and sometimes if families are really troubled, this work is just too overwhelming. We've got, there's one family I can think of right now where it's a, like a 40-year-old guy, his sister and his mother, and they're this really very tightly bonded family unit, but they've all got severe personality disorders and trying to do family work with the three of them. I mean, Frank comes out of the room looking like he just went into combat by himself, it's crazy. So we've sort of backed off from that and we'll, he doesn't do the whole family together as often, he does it periodically, but um, so, some families there's just so much going on it just wouldn't, maybe a two therapist model would work but we just can't afford to do that. Um, again, there's not enough research, um, but we see tremendous results and we really are firm believers in this model and at the end of the day, it, it really does do a lot to support individual recovery and family wellness when you can look at the problem this way. So thank you all for your time. Any other questions, I'm happy to answer if you want to come up.